Welcome to the Empowered Wife Podcast, where it's all about fixing your relationship without your man's conscious effort, so you feel desired, taken care of, and special, even if your relationship feels completely hopeless. I'm Laura Doyle, and today I'm talking about what to do if you're not attracted to your husband. My guest Diane was terrified and shocked when, after a serious accident, her husband completely changed from the person she had known for 30 years to one who was consumed with anger, unpredictable, and unrecognizable from the man she had married. Today, her husband is back to the humble, gentle man who loves to please her and make her happy. She's going to describe exactly what she did to fix her marriage. And then I'll be giving out the Worst Relationship Advice of the Week Award, which is about a personality disorder that your spouse might have. All that is coming up, but first, let's talk about what to do if you're not attracted to your husband. Here's how to get out of marriage purgatory right now. When I married my husband, I thought he was the most handsome, smart, funny, talented guy I'd ever met. I couldn't wait to spend the rest of my life with him. But a few short years into our marriage, I couldn't remember anything I liked about him. He seemed pathetic and immature, lacking ambition and sloppy. He was the same guy, but my view of him had changed. I thought I made a mistake and I should divorce him and try to find someone who suited me better. And looking back, I now realize I would have found myself in the same situation with the next handsome, smart, funny, talented guy. I had three behaviors that were making my husband seem less attractive, and they weren't enhancing the rest of my life either. Not at all. It wasn't until I changed those habits that I went back to seeing him the way I did on our wedding day. When I finally woke up and realized what I was doing, I noticed I wasn't the only one. Lots of wives have these same tendencies that I did. Those tendencies contribute to a lot of needless emotional turmoil and even divorce. Here's what the bad habits are, along with what you can do to turn your frog back into a prince. Number one is mail bashing. Jenna was surprised when her husband decided to hose off their sick kid after he threw up instead of putting him in the bathtub. Jessica found it unbelievable that her husband wanted to watch sports for so many hours on the weekend. Haley found it completely unreasonable that her husband wouldn't let her throw out his holy t-shirts. Men really are from a different planet than women, right? No doubt about it. And when we expect men to do anything the way women do things, we're bound to be disappointed. I used to have a bad habit of getting together with other women to talk about how ridiculous and thoughtless and immature men are. And I punctuated my points with examples of my husband enjoying inane shows like the three stooges or not wiping off the counter when he cleaned the kitchen or proposing hamburgers when I said I wanted to have a healthy lunch. But talking about men, including my own husband that way, and hearing my friends put their men down, that didn't help me feel more accepting and closer to my guy was quite the opposite. It had me questioning why I decided to live with him in the first place. He picked up on it when I made snide remarks echoing the finely honed put downs we'd fashioned in our mail bashing sessions. And he reacted defensively. That just reinforced my negative view of him. That's not a fun place to go. But a night of mail bashing with my girlfriend's would reliably get me to that lonely spot. These days, when I hear a woman starting down that old dirt road, I'm pretty quick to change the subject, knowing she's not going anywhere I want to go. When I focus instead on all the ways my husband makes my life richer, making me laugh, making me tea, paying the bills, making up songs about me, Laura, Laura, I adore you. Oh, then I remember exactly why I chose him. In fact, now I hear so many stories of men knocking themselves out to make their wives and girlfriends happy, to serve their families. My whole perspective has changed. These days, I see examples of men being chivalrous and thoughtful and heroic every day. And I admire that very much. Number two habit that I had was mothering my husband. So anytime you tell your husband to settle down or put that away or even take out the trash, 
you've just left the role of his wife and lover and started acting like his mother. And the same is true if you remind him to call his mom or if you wake him up for work or if you act like his nurse when he's ailing physically. I wrote about this uh, in a blog one time about what to do if your husband is not attracted to you, but it's just as likely to cause you to feel less attracted to him or even repulsed by him. And when I was doing maternal things for my husband, I found him really unappealing. Since mothers are not sexually attracted to their sons, putting myself in that role was a terrible setup for sustaining passion and intimacy. It turns out he didn't want to be parented, and he responded badly when I acted like his mother mother. I couldn't believe he would be so ungrateful and rude when I was sacrificing doing what I wanted to do so I could help him with his responsibilities. So what a mismatch, right? These days, I'm much more focused on myself than what he's doing or not doing, even when he's sick. I'm sympathetic, but I'm also quick to say he's a strong man instead of telling him to lie down or keep his foot elevated. He's smart enough to figure out all that by himself. The result is that he seems much more competent and capable to me, which is far more attractive. And I'm also more attractive to him without the maternal aura. And part of what I'm attracted to about him is how well he admires me. Win-win. The third habit was making myself a martyr. (laughs) Another bad habit I had, I had so many in my early marriage, was being the martyr who was constantly working her fingers to the bone and getting cranky about it a lot. I was giving so much, I was miserable. And to be honest, I hated pretty much everyone. I especially hated my husband because he happened to be nearby. And since I was not happy, he clearly was not making me happy. It would not have mattered if I was married to Ryan Gosling's character from The Notebook. I would have thought he was a worthless, incompetent baby. That's how miserable I was. It really had nothing to do with my poor, unsuspecting husband who didn't force me to deplete myself with things that I thought I had to do. I did that myself. Today, I'm focused on doing everything I can to make myself happy, including taking naps, gabbing with my friends, playing volleyball, lots of volleyball. Um, for example, those things. And guess what? My husband seems way more attractive. Yours will too when you stop male bashing, mothering, and making yourself a martyr. If you're wondering how to get started with fixing your relationship and making it shiny again, then you need a roadmap. Get six simple steps to follow that will set your relationship up for success. Discover three common mistakes that wives make trying to fix their relationship that just make things worse. When you download my free Adored Wife Roadmap, you can do that at GetCherished.com. Go to GetCherished.com now to get your roadmap in minutes. My guest Diane was shocked and terrified when, after a very serious accident, her husband completely changed from the person she had known for 30 years to one who was consumed with anger and acted as though she was the enemy and became controlling, unpredictable, and unrecognizable from the man she had married. She wasn't sure if the intimacy skills applied in her situation, but she decided to experiment with them anyway, and today... Her husband is back to being the humble, gentle man who loves to please her and make her happy. They are back to laughing together and having tender moments as their marriage continues to heal. She's going to describe exactly how she completely transformed what seemed like an impossible challenge. Diane, welcome to the Empowered Wife Podcast. Thank you so much for being on today. Well, thank you for having me, Laura. It's an honor to be here. So take us back to the beginning. What were things like in your marriage in the bad old days? Yeah, well, I guess before the bad old days, um, the good days for 30 years were we just, we were a team. We were best friends. We never really fought about things. Um, We certainly never, ever fought about money. Um, He was the provider. He did all 
all of that side of things, but he was incredibly generous and it was always our money, our our decisions to make in on every level of our marriage. Um, we all were always fairly much in tune with each other. We had lots of fun. We travelled a lot. Uh, we had seven children um, and took them travelling with us all over the world. And and so I mean, we, it wasn't perfect. We had we had ups and downs and many things to navigate, but it was pretty special. And people used to say, "You're a beautiful couple together." Um, and then he had his accident, and to begin with, it wasn't. It, I, I thought that he was coping okay. We were coping okay. He spent months in in hospital, um, had lots of different operations, and the kids and I rallied around him and supported him. And he went through different things. Um, struggled with anger a little bit at times, which was different. But we we just we knew it was from the pain and the sleepless nights and the cycle and losing his job because of the accident losing proper use of his leg um there was so much involved but he he seemed to be doing really really well and the times that he was down and struggling we were there um to encourage support him and he seemed to get through it and the times that he was angry in the beginning he would apologize he even took us away one weekend to apologize um, for an angry outburst that he'd had. Um, it was after his last operation uh, that I noticed, and I'd noticed little changes after each operation, but after this last operation, he um, a few days after he was home, I noticed he was just different. Um, he didn't seem to be coping well. He was struggling. He was getting angrier and angrier, um, started to withdraw get moody I remember it was our daughter's birthday her 12th birthday and we'd had such a fun day um the kids and I he had just been outside doing his own thing um we had a dinner and I noticed at the table he was sitting just quietly just looking down the whole time he was sitting next to his mum didn't talk to his mum um just really was withdrawn and later that night I, I asked him was anything wrong and he it was like it was really like floodgates had opened and he just poured out a whole lot of hate about me hate about what a terrible woman i was and a terrible wife and it just went on and on and on and and then he went up to bed and um and it just got worse from there um i was reeling and for months i really didn't i think i was in shock and he started to get extremely controlling and treating particularly me differently. And gradually he started to treat the kids really differently to the point where life was really, really difficult, really hard. I mean, we couldn't, I couldn't use a computer. We only had one computer in the house. Um, our kids were homeschooled. So, you know, he'd lock his study door and spend hours in there. And his his behaviour was just bizarre and frightening and affected us all affected the kids and me um I didn't see it as a marriage issue it wasn't to begin with but it did end up it absolutely ended up um affecting our marriage terribly and affecting the relationship with the kids he got very demanding at times um just stood there in my face telling me that I needed to obey him which was complete complete change from the man that he used to be um so yeah how am I, I could go on and on and on but I, I yeah it just got worse and I did get to the point where I I didn't reach out for help in respect for him um I knew the man that he was inside and I just held on to the hope that he was still there. I was confused. I, I didn't know. So the kids and I just tried to cope with what was going on. Um, but it was getting really, really difficult. He was having panic attacks, extremely reactive um, to anything. I remember my daughter came home to surprise us. We had a couple of kids living away by then. My daughter came home to surprise us and we just got to bed and he heard a noise outside and he was shaking he got out of bed and he was shaking and panicking and saying who's that who's that and getting angrier and angrier and I just said oh 
it's probably just one of the kids coming to surprise us. Um, and it was. Well, I didn't get out of bed fast enough and he got down the stairs first and was on the stairs. And I remember he got stuck into her. Sorry. And told her to never do it again. And she had no right to be to be coming in that late and surprising them. It was just awful. And things like that um, just happened over and over. And it broke the relationship between the kids, kids and him. Um, they actually begged me to leave him at one stage, many stages, even the little one. Um, it was tough. And the places I reached out to church, um, we had friends that knew my husband all his life and knew that he was a humble, loving, kind guy and could see now the changes in him. They tried to help. They sent us to counsellors and um, tried. I tried lots and lots of different things. I tried standing up um, to him. I tried just going along with it. I just tried so many things and um, the counsellors didn't work, that nothing worked. Um, it was hard. So the children are begging you to leave him. Mm -hmm. And what were you thinking at this time? It was hard. I I didn't feel that in my heart to leave him. I just couldn't bring myself to do that. But then I would have times when I was terrified that I was damaging the kids by staying, that it was going to affect them, well, it was affecting them, but that it was going to have long-term effects and that I was doing the wrong thing by staying. We actually en did end up early on leaving for would have been about a month, went and stayed with our older daughter because um, this friend that had known he all his life was actually um, visiting with him throughout this time and was a completely different person with him and was a completely different person at church and would come home. And I stopped going to church for that time because I just couldn't bear to see who he was there and who he was here at home. Um, but this friend came and said to me, look, he's, he's come and visited and said, look, if she thinks it's bad now, um, she doesn't know what she's in for because I'm going to make it much worse. Ooh. And this was a man that didn't have, he didn't have a harsh bone in his body beforehand. And so this friend encouraged the kids and I to, to leave. And so we did for a little while. Um, we went and stayed with our daughter. and. I thought that might in inspire my husband to change and see see what he was doing, but it didn't. He just hunkered down at home, um, didn't communicate with us, got more angry, if anything, because he saw me as the enemy. He saw me as the one causing all of this. Wow. So it, it sounds very hopeless. You must have felt some tremendous it's a life sentence really to it's not the man you married you're experiencing someone completely different so what did you this do friend of ours said to me that um because I, I went to him many times and he he said die this is who he is now oh this is who he is now and that's not going to change and you need to make the decision can you live with that for the rest of your life. Wow. What were you thinking at that point? Could you? Could you live with that for the rest of your life? I didn't want to. No, no, I no, I don't think we could have. It was too hard. Yeah. I, I did panic. I was because I was a stay-at-home mum for 30 years. I had no money. And all of a sudden he was saying it was his money and I hadn't earned a cent and I was lazy and I needed to get a job. And um, and he used to he used to verbally respect me and value me as as and the place I had in in, in the home. I remember this one time I we needed food, we didn't have any, and I asked him for some money and he said no. You you know, no. That was it. And so I'd, I'd actually found you at this stage, Laura, and 
um, actually the first time I found you, I found your book, The Surrendered Wife, and I downloaded it. And we've got a joint Kindle. So my husband saw it. And, of course, from his point of view, I needed to obey. And he was in a place where I needed to surrender. So he said, yeah, this book's this book looks really good. Read it. And so I sort of set it aside for a while because that just sort of, you know. <laughs> it's impossible to read. That's exactly I know. It. I know. <laughs> like, who could read a book after that? No. Uh, Awful. But anyway, so I thought I had I had learned a little bit about skills, and um, so I thought, how can I handle this differently? And so I wrote down a shopping list, and when I, I handed it to him at a later date, and he was going into town, and I said, um, "Here's here's the list. This is the the food that we need. Um, you know, could you please get it for me?" And he said why you get it anyway he took the list and I just said I can't I have no money and that was it I walked away anyway he came home with all of the shopping and um we had food so I thought yeah I didn't normally I would have gone into an argument and just really you know tried to persuade him to give me money and yeah so so that was that made it easier for me yeah and I remember at the time thinking, well, I'd been learning what you'd said about, you know, trusting and um, what your focus on grows. So I remember thinking, I'm going to trust that he will look after us. But, yeah, he didn't give us money for a long time. Wow. So well, how did you find the surrendered wife? So you were looking for something. You'd been to church. You'd tried various resources. Uh, what? What made you, because you said it really didn't feel like a marriage problem initially. It just felt like your husband had been body snatched, really. It sounds like, like he'd been taken from you almost. Yeah. Yeah, it did. And um, I remember just Googling in, there were many tears. I, I just, I ended up having quite a meltdown and just cried buckets of tears over that time. And, um, I remember just typing into the computer one day, what do you do when? And I can't remember what I said. At that time, I could have ticked off a list, and the kids actually did, ticked off a list of what is an abusive husband. Yes, yeah. And there was probably only one one thing that he didn't, we couldn't tick. Um, but the rest of the list, we could have. And you popped up, and I started listening and looking into it and reading the book I did pick up the surrendered wife and I did read it <laughs> and I still was struggling with how to get it how did it fit with my situation because I had never seen myself as a controlling wife in fact my sister said Di you're just too too gentle to giving to um you know you're you need already, to stand you're already a doormat Maybe, in a way. Yeah. Oh, I didn't feel a doormat until yeah. perhaps these. Well, I didn't feel a doormat for the thirty years at all, yeah. um, until this. The changes. Um, so yeah, I didn't quite understand how it could fit, but I was so desperate by then that, um, and I couldn't really speak to anyone about it. I mean, my friends just thought you've got to leave. Um, this friend that knew both of us felt the same, even though he didn't say it outright. <laughs> um, and I also found that it wasn't helping me pouring my heart out all the time, trying to get people. I was trying to understand what was going on. So to do that, I was sharing, and that just made me feel terrible. Mm. So because um, there was no resolution afterwards, it was just sort of a venting and, and that was it. There was no help. Loving. I mean, some of my friends were completely loving, but it was just draining. Yeah. Yeah. Because they couldn't help you solve it. And you no. were focusing on everything that was wrong. Which yeah. Kind of. Yeah. It, and I thought I was doing that to try and understand it and try and 
show the few people that I talked to um, what was going on so that they might be able to help. I think it's so remarkable that you, even though everyone was saying, leave him, he's abusive. This quiz online says he's abusive. The kids say, leave him. That wasn't your position. That's not the choice you made. You were very committed, Diane. Yeah, and the times the times that I thought I can't do this and I just need to leave. Um, but I knew who he was and I knew what we'd experienced as a family and I, I guess I wasn't ready to let that go. I wasn't I still believed that deep down that he was there somewhere. I love that. I think that is so inspiring because, um, yeah, well, let's let's continue with this story. So you uh, you found the surrendered wife. You started to do things a little bit differently. What, what did you first do? You, you gave him this grocery list and he brought home some groceries. What else did you do that was different than what you had been doing? I was, I was just... I was dabbling with little bits and pieces of the skills because I still honestly couldn't get my head around how they worked for me. I was having trouble respecting. Yes. It was really hard um, when he was doing these things to to respect him. Of course. Um, I think what I did was focus on me and I realised how depleted I was, how worn out, how exhausted. And so one of the things I did pick up on in those early days was I needed to look after me. And so I did start to do that more. And I did in the earlier days, I'd I'd get away with the kids. I'd take them to stay with our older siblings and um, just get time away rather than try and persevere and cope. Uh, Yeah. So how did that... uh... How did that make a difference? Look, it did. It really did. I'd come back with um, refreshed and with more um, enthusiasm and courage to just to work on things, to keep working through this, keep holding on. It gave you optimism, it sounds like. Yeah. 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 And so, so what else? What, uh, what happened? Things did settle down and we'd have some reasonable times. The relationship with the kids was still extremely strained and they didn't want to come home, the older ones. Their relationship was really broken, understandably. And as I learned more about the skills, I I couldn't do any of the programs because I didn't have any money at that stage. Um, I eventually did sign up for the SWOO program and still having trouble with getting a, getting around my head how it related to my situation. But I was putting little things in place, trying to, to um, be respectful, trying to have, more, you know, be thankful for things, trying to look, I was trying to look for the good in things. And so there were little, and I could see him respond. I, looking back, I could see the hints there that yeah there's something in this I don't think I was in I still think I was in a place where I wasn't ready to to be fully committed I guess Hmm. or or the know-how yes they can be pretty tricky to implement by yourself sometimes right it seems so counter um in your situation was quite scary really quite severe it sounds like so um it would take enormous courage so you uh there was a story about him asking you to take care of the cars i think at one point that you shared that i loved there was i i actually did eventually get a job it was a few years into this i mean this has been going this went on for about five years wow um I couldn't get a job and my sister begged me to get a job, get out of the house, just do something different, but I couldn't leave the kids yeah. um, because of the way he was treating them. And I just couldn't, I was, I couldn't go out with friends. I 
um, unless the kids were with me. I just didn't feel comfortable and it was safe enough to leave the kids. And so I did get a job. It was just a few hours a week. I was an, originally a nurse and I, I found a job that I loved helping people in their homes with respite and, and care and different things. And I could choose the hours and just be away for a little bit. But I wasn't making very much money. <laughs> and came to me one day and said, your car needs a service. You need to pay for it. It was going to be, I think, $1,500. Well, I didn't have that sort of money. And I normally I would have panicked and I would have tried to explain that I can't do that and it would have ended up, you know, as going at it. I mean, we didn't really, we were never been really yellows and, and fighters, but, but there would have been a disagreement. So I, I didn't. I, I just, I thought, and I love the <laughs> these phrases that you can use. Um, and I clung on to those because I thought, you know, they were easy to grab. And I just said, I can't. And he went into a tirade of why I have to and that it, you know, the car was going to be ruined and he wasn't going to do it. And um, the next day he came to me again and asked again. And I said, I can't. Well, he got angry and upset and I just walked away. And then a few days later he came again and I thought, well, I don't remember in the skills, you know, hearing what to do on the third time with the same thing. Um, but I just said, <laughs> I can't. And then I remembered something and I, I thought, okay, I'll try this. And I said, you've always taken such good care of the cars and, uh, and of us. You've always made sure we're safe and I trust you to make the right decision regarding the car and the service. Um, and I want to thank you for looking after us so well. And I walked away. He didn't say anything. <laughs> and, you know, I walked away and I thought, yes. I feel, I, I, you know, I did it. I just feel courageous yeah. and calm and empowered. <laughs> was, I remember that feeling so well. Anyway, a few days after that, or it might have been the next week, he came in smiling and said, I've just had the car serviced and I got a really big discount. And he went on to tell me all about the discount. Um I just thought, wow, these skills really work. <laughs> so this was a glimpse of, oh, did you feel like you were seeing your husband, the, the man you married again, a glimpse of him? Yes. Yeah, I did. Mind you, I was so nervous saying I can't. It was the first time I'd used it and I, how can I say that? I can't. So I was really nervous, but I pushed myself to do it. Fantastic. I love it. And so, um, so this made you feel even more hopeful that you got such a great response from him. So, uh, and you thought, okay, this is working. So, and then, and then, so what happened? Did you went deeper with the skills, I think. Things settled down and I could see that the skills um, were working and particularly me focusing on myself because I'd really lost myself during that time. I, I mean, I was a mum of seven children for so long and um, I think I, I I did realize that I'd become enmeshed and I was so dependent on him for my happiness. Um, I didn't realize that. So focusing on me and and starting to do things that I enjoyed was probably one of the biggest ones for me. and. But we st it was still a roller coaster. Mm. Things eased off and things weren't as bad as they were in the beginning. Um, we even went on a holiday together and he said to me, I remember him saying, I want to talk. And I thought, oh, no, because things were still at times really quite bad. Anyway, he shared that he wanted to work on the wheels together. And so he chatted about what his desires were and it was including the kids and it was um, he wanted to know what I thought and um, so that was that was really beautiful and that was just with me implementing the skills in a very raw, in a very inexperienced sort of way. But we were still having, yeah. he was 
was still having times where he just would revert back to that angry, aggressive, domineering. And then you'd see it again, come back. You'd see him come back and then he'd go again and come back. And it came to a bit of a head. Well, it did come to a head last June. And it was as recently as just last June. And I was standing at the end of the bed and he was just telling me what he thought of me, that I was a liar and I was abusive and that I was this and I was that. And it was really hurtful and I'd, I'd heard this for weeks on end. There'd been no intimacy for six months at this, this stage and I just stood there and thought, I, I actually don't want to do this anymore. And I didn't mean I wanted out of our marriage. I meant I, this is unhealthy for him, for me. I just don't want to do this anymore. And I, I walked out and I went down the paddock and I was sort of stomping down the paddock f- for me. I'm not a very overly, you know, out there person, loud or noisy. So um, I was walking through the paddock mumbling and, and venting to myself and and probably God. <laughs> Um, and halfway down the paddock I started to shift and I thought I'm I'm not going to do this anymore I'm unhappy I want to enjoy the rest of my life and I thought I'm going to do whatever it takes for me to be happy and enjoy life and be the best person that I could be. Um, I'd lost a lot of, I felt that I'd lost a lot of dignity because even though I felt that I'd coped really well for a lot of the time, um, there were times when I just was reactive and just didn't have the strength and I just didn't show up very nicely. And and I'd so feel so guilty and I didn't want I just didn't want it anymore. I wanted a loving relationship and I knew I couldn't do anything about my husband. So down that paddock, I I decided it back in last year, this is it. If I don't change this now, I don't think it's ever going to change. And I committed to myself to do whatever it took. And I had no idea what that was. Honestly, I just said, I am going to do whatever it takes. Walking back, I knew that it included the skills and you, Laura, I knew deep down that that's what, it, that's what I meant when I said to myself, whatever it takes, and I had no idea. I, I actually came back and I was, I was committed. I thought, I'm going to do this for me. Forget what's going on. Forget my husband. Um, I'm going to do this for me. And... So I came home and my son had actually asked me to come down and have a few days just with him, just me. And so I thought, yeah, I'm going to do that. So I got in the car, drove down. It was pouring with rain and I I listened to your podcasts for three hours on the way down. It was pouring with rain and stormy, but it was also stormy in the car because I cried and and I laughed and I just went through all the emotions in the car listening to your podcasts. And I remember how soothing they were and how by the time I got to, to my son's place, my mindset had shifted. And so I spent five days with him. He was working some of the time, so I had a lot of time to myself, some time with him, which was beautiful. And I just read, reread your books, listened to as many podcasts as I could, um, revisited the skills and just really immersed myself in the intimacy skills and all things Laura Doyle. <laughs> and I just, I could feel the shift. And on the way home again, for the three hours, I listened to the podcasts again. And I got home and my husband seemed calmer in the next few days. And I was thinking about this yesterday and thinking I came home different I came home with a different vision a different perspective I came home focused on me and in a way I thought you know um just forget him forget the rest of it I mean I still wanted our marriage 
Um, but this is about me. And any time that anything came up that started to, I started to feel agitated or upset with how he was treating me, I'd just say to myself, I don't need to think about that. I need to think about me. And so in, in lots of ways it was easy because I didn't have to engage in a conversation or anything. Um, but I remember sitting down and, and with him and he was he was a little talkative because before this he would avoid me and didn't want to spend any time with me um, in bed. He would sleep over the other side of the bed and if I dared accidentally touch him, he would flinch and move further away or shove me back over the other side of the bed. Wow. Um, that was pretty terrible. But I had this new conviction and no idea what it really meant. Uh, but on the way home, you had the five-day challenge come up and I knew I was of my commitment and I said, yep, I'm going to say yes to this, I'm going to do this. So I did and so that immediately followed when I was coming home and I remember I thought okay I'm a different person you know I'm I'm going to show up differently I'm going to focus on me and he must have felt that he did yeah aura coming from me because he seemed a lot calmer and I went out one day I said it was a few days after I got home I said I'll come and help you plant the trees and he was, he was working in front of me, digging with a drill, digging the holes, and I was following, putting the trees in. And all I could was going around in my mind, do whatever you can. Do whatever you can to change you. It was a beautiful sunny day. And so I said to him, oh, it's so nice out here working with you. It's so peaceful and, and beautiful. Didn't say anything. Anyway, I thought, okay, it'd be a little bit flirty came to mind. And I'm not a out there flirty person and I thought nah nah <laughs> can't do this and then he he bent over to put the to dig the hole and I thought hmm what would flirty be pinch his butt I can't do that can't do that <laughs> here I am how many years married and I still couldn't pinch my husband's butt <laughs> um but mind you I was coming from a place where he wouldn't even sleep close to me in bed but so I did I had to actually force myself and I went over, pinched his butt, and he jumped. Didn't say anything. I thought I glimpsed a tiny smile, but he didn't say anything. We kept planting trees. And then we got we got back into the buggy, and I dropped something getting in, and I went to jump off to pick it up. And he, he put his hand on my arm and said, no, you stay there. I'll get it. Mm. Well, who is this man? And I thought, well, that butt pinch really, really did something. Anyway, so I thanked him and we, we drove off and he was driving around a strange way. I thought we were going back to the house and we've got these tree plots all over the farm and he drove into a tree plot and I just said, oh, are you having a look at the trees? And he just screamed and he stopped and he pulled out some coats from the back, lay them on the ground in the grass, which was really high. We're surrounded by the sunshine and trees and and he invited me to have an intimate um, moment with him and I, I I first said what here and he just smiled and said yeah and so I just thought okay do whatever you can so I went along with it and it was beautiful and it was scary because I thought I hope the kids can't see us <laughs> <laughs> and it just from that moment, I, I knew, I knew that this shift in me was making a difference. Wow. This me being committed to, to changing me um, and using the skills had, had made a difference. So you, in that moment, when you had the epiphany, like, just do it for me, it sounds like you sort of left, there was a victim mentality, I think prior to that is that fair absolutely to and you kind of left that and said no I'm I've got some power here I'm going to do I'm going to use my power there definitely was a victim mentality and I didn't know how to that seemed to seep in and I thought I'm being treated this way and I was yeah um, in many ways I was sure. a victim and I had tried 
to not be a victim, but um, yeah, I, I had. I think I had given up hope that I could do anything about what was going on. Yes, yes. And you somehow found that power within um, some happiness. Mm. Uh, yeah, and that courageous flirtation of pinching his butt is such a great story. So, um, so that was, so things started to crack open in your marriage. They did. They didn't just crack open. They changed from that moment on. I mean, from that moment, he has, that was last June, he hasn't had a tirade calling me names or, or there has not been one. I mean, he's been upset with me at different times but um, handled it quite differently. I haven't had um, those awful, hurtful words poured at me Um from that moment, he's he started to cuddle me in bed and actually lately has just been lying there with me in his arms talking to me. And before that, if I tried to speak in, in bed, he would he would snap something at me, turn over and give me the silent treatment for days, no matter what I said, even if it was I love you. So, <laughs> um, yeah, from that moment it, it changed and it we have we still have had moments where things have haven't gone that well but it's more back to just the normal days where you're just off um nothing like what it what it was he started not long after that he started to seek me out throughout the day which was a huge change because he hadn't wanted to have anything to do with me wouldn't take me away, wouldn't celebrate anniversary with me. I suggested we go out one of the, one anniversary. This was before last June when I made this commitment and he said, why would I do that? Ooh. Oh, it, it hurt. Um, but, Laura, two weeks ago he organised a weekend away just for him and I and it was beautiful. So the romance is back. The connection. Mm. What's it like? What's it like on a day to day basis in your marriage now? Filled with coffee because he makes me a coffee in bed and brings it up and seeks me out throughout the day. The kids say, Mum and Dad, you're drinking too much coffee. <laughs> but I haven't got the heart to say no because it means he's wanting to sit and chat with me while we have a coffee. <laughs> um, he smiles so much more, Laura. I'm. I'm doing less, so much less. I actually sat on the couch a few weeks back and, and I was tired and I thought, I just don't want to do kitchen cleanup. And I sat there and I felt guilty, but he got up and did it. I didn't say a word. He just got up and cleaned the kitchen. And even the other day when I was pretty, I was tired and I, was, I came down again, I'd cleaned the kitchen several times during the day. I, I came down and the dishes were all over the sink and the dishwasher hadn't been emptied. And I just set out into space, really. No, actually, I was probably really talking to my son. Um, does, does no one in this house know how to do dishes? And so that was pretty critical and narky. And, but you know what? I got up and cleaned the kitchen. That's so I right. thought... I've got enough grace and love in the bank now that that when things do start to agitate us or we are upset, we handle them so differently, so much better. And I was thinking about this too, that for those 30 years, yes, we had a wonderful, happy marriage, but there would have been things that the skills would have helped with to make it even more wonderful even happier oh, it kind of sounds like a miracle what you're describing from it is if you could have seen him before and our family I watched we had Christmas together down with my son in, in um, down at a beach place and I've just watched my husband calm down and change he smiles and he laughs um, we hadn't seen a smile or a laugh for years and he, I was watching him playing table tennis with our son 
the other day and I thought, had I given up, I'd have missed out. I'd have, I'd have robbed these kids of the healing and the forgiveness and, and the new relationship that they've got with him. And Christmas was absolutely beautiful um, in those years, those difficult years, if there were birthdays or Christmases, my husband would sit to the side broody and just not participate, no matter how much the kids tried to get him to. This Christmas, he was in there decorating the tree and laughing. And my oldest son actually picked him up to put a decoration up the top. And I've got a beautiful picture of them both laughing. And over Christmas, the kids would say, Mum, look at Dad. He's in the kitchen again. Mum, he's in the kitchen again. He was just doing everything he could to, to participate and help. And he keeps coming up with presents for the kids, thoughtful gifts that he thought they might like, and me. So it just was a reminder to me that the hanging in was worth it and that I would have missed all this beautiful, I would have missed it. The kids would have missed it. And it would have been a completely different story. Yes, it would have been. It's very sobering to think about mm. what you would have missed. I've had that thought many times, like, look at what I would have missed had I given up. And so it is it's very inspiring to, even though it was so dark, you never mm. gave up. And now you're uh, reaping the benefits of, you must feel very accomplished. I do. I I think that's that's one of the blessings of the skills. I just finding me, finding my voice, finding who I really want to be, finding myself again and giving myself time to to discover what it is that makes me happy. One of the biggest things I've learned is that I'm responsible for me, how I show up, no matter what's going on. Um and it was easy in those days to make the excuse, well, you know, he's treating me this way. You know, this is happening. How, how can you? I? Yeah. How, how can, can I? I be happy? How how can I not say anything? You know, uh, it was easy to fall down that victim track, and I did. But asking myself, I think, what do I want? How do I feel? And also having grace because I, I felt so guilty at times when I did react instead of respond, when I didn't cope so well, even for staying, I felt guilty. Um, when we left for that time, I felt guilty. And learning to have grace for myself, that was beautiful. That was really, really helpful. But learning that that I'm responsible for my happiness has actually given me a lot of freedom and a lot of courage. And um, yeah, it's been, it's been pretty wonderful. Well, I love it. You, um, you sound incredibly wise and you obviously have so much, um, such a wonderful experience to share. What is your tip for a woman who's listening and thinking, yeah, my husband's not the man I married. You know, he's become, horrible he's become abusive and she wants to um have what you have where uh he's uh bringing her so much coffee that the kids say you're drinking too much coffee and wanting to talk to her so much and uh where there's this it sounds like your family's been reunited the, the relationship with the kids is healed even it sounds like yes it is yeah. beautifully yeah it's so, so good says, with them <laughs> so now, she says, I want what you have, Diane. How? Where should it, she start? Where do I start? Remember who he was. Remember who you married, the man that he was. There's a good chance that man's still there, that he's still inside this person that, that has changed. Definitely have hope. Hope this no matter what your situation. Like I thought, this this is hopeless, my situation. Mm -hmm. He's not gonna, you know, people were telling me he's not gonna change. Have hope. There is hope. I think the hope 
was in recognizing for me that I could do something about it because mm-hmm. I felt for so long that I couldn't. I tried. I tried to do something and it just didn't work. Um, so for me, learning that I could actually do something about this and trying it, just starting wobbly steps and trying it and seeing that it actually did make a difference. Um, but the one of the biggest things I think for me is don't do it alone. I tried first because I didn't have the money um, or the ability and I tried to to dabble alone and I did have some success and it did get me to through to to where I could make a, a commitment. Um, but there are women out there, no matter what your situation, that have travelled similar roads know know your pain have felt that pain have lived that pain and have transformed their lives and people women who who are standing for their marriages and are ready to stand with your marriage with you for your marriage and to help you show up the best person that you can be regardless of what's going on around you women that like at times I felt I couldn't stand and Back then, I would have loved. Um, look, I think for me, there was reason for the timing, but mm. to have someone that, that's been through heartbreak, heartache, and similar things has have known has known the pain, but has gotten through that and has transformed their life, their marriage. Who are willing to stand with you and and share their journey to help you, uh, don't do it alone. That would be my biggest tip. Powerful. So what would you say to Diane if you could go back in time and tell her, what, what do you know now? I know that it's important to not give up hope. I know that... I'm responsible for my happiness and for how I live my life. I know that I'm valued and I've learnt again to love myself and respect myself. In some ways, this journey has led me to where I am today and I am grateful for that. I tell myself that you're going to get there, you're going to, get through this and you're going to look back and you're going to see a beautiful family that's healed. Yeah, you're making me cry, Diane. (laughs) It really is all it's cracked up to be, isn't it? It is. It it is. And at times I just think, wow, you know, because the skills seem so simple in some respects. But so life changing. Yeah, look, I I wouldn't be where I am today without them and without the community. I I, I really wouldn't. Well, I'm so grateful and happy to have you in the community because you are an inspiration and a beacon of hope for what is possible. And I'm just so uh, gratified to get to be on this journey with you because. Uh, you, what you've done is amazing. It really is a miracle. Well, thank you, Laura. And you know, I, I want to thank you because if not for you, I would most probably be still struggling if it wasn't for finding the skills, finding all that, that you've developed and grown and the community that, that you've put in place. Uh, so I just want to say thank you. Thank you. You've changed my life and my family's, really. That's wonderful to hear. Thank you so much. If you'd like to be my guest on the Empowered Wife podcast and share about how you fixed a struggling relationship using the six intimacy skills, I would love to interview you. Just go to lauradoyle.org slash podcast dash guest to let me know that you are willing to make a big contribution to ending world divorce 
by telling your relationship story. I look forward to meeting you. That's lauradoyle.org slash podcast dash guest. It's time for the Worst Relationship Advice of the Week Award. It's the Worst Relationship Advice of the Worst Relationship Advice. Yeah, it's the Worst Relationship Advice of the Worst Relationship Advice of the Week. And the advice I find most unhinged this week is from a clinical psychologist who wrote an article about something called avoidant personality disorder. And he says it's obscure compared to narcissistic personality disorder, borderline personality disorders. But he argues that once you understand that your partner suffers from a, quote, true psychological pathology, you will, quote, no longer have to take the emotionally dysfunctional behavior personally. So... These kinds of diagnoses, they are more tempting than tacos on Taco Tuesday, especially when you're suffering and you're just looking for some kind of explanation about why your husband is avoiding you. I remember being so excited to get my husband's diagnosis because I finally felt validated. Of course, I had been right all along that he had a disorder. I I get to be right. I love to be right. No wonder I was having to do everything myself. He was mentally unwell. So I got that negative label for him and that was validating. But then there was another problem. Instead of having the happily ever after marriage I dreamed of when I said I do, I had a lot of stress and frankly, a lot of hopelessness that my marriage would never get better because now it was clear that my husband was dysfunctional and disordered permanently. So that means forever and forever. And let's not forget ever. That meant the rest of my life was just going to be hard and terrible. Far from being clarifying and helpful, focusing on this diagnosis just made me gather more evidence that it was true. I was like, see, there he goes again. He forgot to put the trash out. That's proof. He has a disorder. See, he made a mistake on the taxes. He just isn't well. He didn't drive the most efficient route because he is dysfunctional. It all made sense through these glasses I was wearing with this lens labeled disordered. And all of it was a colossal distraction from looking at how I could improve my small corner of the world, how I could clean up my side of the street. I was so consumed with ticking off all the evidence I had that he was deficient, I never got to spend much time working on being a better wife, a happier wife, a grateful wife, a respectful wife, a playful wife. There was plenty of room for improvement on my side, but That just wasn't my focus because I was so in the habit of looking at what my husband was doing wrong. So I can just imagine myself years ago reading about this new diagnosis, avoidant personality disorder, and going off on a miserable tangent about my husband definitely having that. Instead of reflecting on how my being overbearing and controlling might cause him to want to avoid me. My husband's diagnosis from the bad old days no longer hurts me. It doesn't hurt our relationship. The guy doesn't seem deficient or disordered to me at all now. Did he change? Did I? Was he misdiagnosed? I now suspect what he had was a terrible, severe case of controlling wife syndrome. That's enough to make anyone seem like they have avoidant personality disorder. What you focus on increases and no wife ever got happier because she got her husband diagnosed with a scary pathology and then focused on it. I'm embarrassed to say I've already tried that and it didn't work at all. And I sure didn't take it any less personally when he didn't meet my expectations. Even once I knew his diagnosis, it hurt just as bad. For that reason, the advice that once you understand that your partner suffers from a true psychological pathology, you will no longer have to take the emotionally dysfunctional behavior personally, 
is the very worst advice I've heard all week. Listen and subscribe to the Empowered Wife podcast. Next week, we'll talk about seven ways to become more confident. In the meantime, I hope you're having lots of fun. Today's fun fact is that we've been waking up to the Bill Withers song, Lovely Day, recently. And as soon as it comes on, John and I wave our phones back and forth like we're at a concert in bed. <laughs>